Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the KCM Sports Podcast. My name is Jordan Smith. Alongside me is the co-host and a voice of the Bearcats and the Hornets in Mr. Carlos Zimmerman. Carlos, how are you doing here today? I'm doing fine, sir. Just peachy. <laughs> it's, it's warm outside. It's nice and cool inside here. I'm glad to be doing this uh, once again with you. It's been a while since you and I have gotten to do something like this. It's, what, two years since we were doing our undergrad and at Sam and... We, we had our little radio show on 90.5, and now we're back doing this on a podcast form. Yeah, basically. I mean, it's, like you said, it's probably been about a couple of years um, since we had our award-winning show. Yes, award-winning <laughs> show. <laughs> just, we have to plug that every time. Yeah, just plug it every time for our own ego sake, and then uh, we actually had a comment in our uh, YouTube chat <laughs> the, uh, the in our first episode from uh-huh. a colleague of ours, Luke Scott. Yes. Yeah, so we had to just kind of, you know, punch that in there for them. We have to um, remind them. We have to we have to <laughs> humble the young ones. <laughs> Y'all ran because we walked. No, we No, we we ran, ran so, so they, they could, could walk. walk. Yeah. How, how'd you mm, I try fine. to make that sound good. It, it's it's the first day. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we got a jam-packed show for y'all. A couple hours here of sports talk. Uh, we're going to start it off here with a little bit of uh, NBA talk and free agency, but we'll also get into the College World Series. We'll get into some MLB baseball and kind of what is going on with that sport right now because there's a lot going there's, on. There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot going on in the world of baseball right now. Uh, and then we'll end the show talking about Huntsville Athletics uh, and Sam Houston Athletics as well. So let's go ahead and start off the show with free agency talk. But first... Let's actually talk about something that impacts free agency with the Bradley Beal and Chris Paul deal. Swapping players, Bradley Beal no longer a part of the Wizards as he goes to Phoenix. Chris Paul now going to Washington, uh, as some would like to point out, pulls off the point guard trifecta Mm. of Chris Paul, John Wall, and Russell Westbrook all going to those same three teams at some point in their career. (laughs) The Rockets, the Wizards. And the Clippers. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine that one. It's insane. <laughs> but full details uh, of the trade, really the first big move of the free agency, cause, or I guess the offseason, because it's now the offseason that the finals are done with. The Suns get Bradley Beal, Jordan Goodwin, and Isaiah Todd. And the Wizards get Chris Paul, Landry Shamet, multiple second-round picks, and, and including also pick swaps as well uh, between both sides. Uh, the Wizards are going to have to do a little bit of magic, though, with their salary cap. They need to guarantee an extra $9 million or so in Paul's salary in order to get under the cap to be able to make the deal work. It'll bring his total guarantee up to about $25 million for his contract. But apparently, the Wizards are reportedly looking to part ways to reroute Paul to a contender with the Clippers emerging as a possible destination. So that would make more sense to just kind of bounce him back maybe get some more picks to bring it back and almost kind of work back to where you were and save money in the long run. It's a weird trade for me. Like, I get why Bradley Beal is gone, whether he requested for it or the Wizards just say, hey, go try to get yourself a ring. You've done enough here. Um, The Chris Paul thing I didn't understand, but I kind of understood at the same time because you got to trade, you know, the point guards, but... The, at the same time, it's like, I don't know. I feel like at this point, if you're Chris Paul, you're you're kind of running out of options in your career. Yeah, I mean, you look at the, the trajectory of Chris Paul's career. I mean, it starts very promising in New Orleans and then bouncing around from team to team, and then he lands in Los Angeles and with the Clippers, and we thought, you know, him, Blake Griffin, a duo to be feared, and they absolutely were. Right. And but what's really hindered Chris Paul, and I'm, I'll make the argument here, and yeah, is he a Hall of Famer? Absolutely. I think his numbers, the numbers don't lie. But the thing that is always going to be held over his head is where's the ring? Mm-hmm. And he has done, he has gone to several teams with those opportunities to get said ring: Los Angeles, Houston, Phoenix, and it hasn't happened. So whenever I saw this trade pop up, Jordan, um, and he was going to Washington, and I was like. This doesn't make any sense. He, he, he needs to go to a contender because Washington, their, their contending window has been, you know, rather shut for the last couple of years. So 
I, when I saw that yesterday, that you know, there's a chance that you know that he becomes a free agent uh, by the end of the month. Uh, that made more sense to me because I don't think he is going to start the 2023 season with Washington. No, and there, if you really look at it, there's no reason for him to honestly. If you know the Clippers, I guess makes sense. They're kind of rebuilding, at least in my opinion, they're rebuilding right now. You still got Kawhi, you still got PG thirteen, but. You know, I just I don't feel like the Clippers have it yet. If you want to just get the reunion and get them back to L.A., sure. But I, I'm not sitting here and not thinking of too many options that Chris Paul has to go. Now, granted, there are very, very small rumors that were happening uh, within the last week or so. Uh, potentially Chris Paul coming back to Houston. But granted, there's been about four or five different players all at the same time being rumored to come to Houston, including Zion Williams, and to, including James Harden, who has said he's very open to a reunion with the Houston Rockets. Um, Zion Williamson, by the way. I don't know why I said Williams. <laughs> um, Chris Paul has been kind of rumored just a slight bit in, in those talks. But at the same time, if you're Houston, you're even going to try to get one of those players you're going to have to give up a lot. You're going to have to give up a lot of your rookie talent. You're going to have to give up a good amount of picks. You're going to have to give up whatever you've built so far, which hasn't panned out too well, but it's at least good for them to see them be more aggressive. Now, the whole thing with James Harden, the only way that makes sense is if he becomes a point guard. But even then, you got Kevin Porter Jr. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not saying he's better than James Harden, but you basically, you bring in James Harden, Kevin Porter becomes your sixth man. What then happens with the rest of your guys? It it just, it seems like a weird fit to me because James Harden would just go to the point guard spot at this point. Yeah, and uh, well, the thing with Harden is, and I read this yesterday, you know, there's a lot more optimism in the city of brotherly love right now that they're going to settle the contract and keep Harden in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. He's got until the 29th to decide on his contract and his player option, I should say. Right. Um, so it's, I really think for lack of a better term, the ball's in Harden's court right now. Yeah. So, I mean, I would love to see him back in, in the red and white in Houston. I, I think it'd be a great reunion and more importantly, a veteran leader yeah. to lead at this young squad of Kevin Porter Jr. Jabari Smith. Right. So, that would be a great focal point to have here. It's a matter of he if he wants it at the end of the day. I know you said he's he's shown interest in coming back to Houston, but like I said, it's it's up to him at this point. And it's a that's a good chunk of change right there to pick up that player option, thirty five point six million to yeah. stay in Philadelphia. But here's the question though: Do you, d- does he think he can compete more in Philadelphia, or can he? be the ringleader of the rebuild that is in Houston. And that's yeah, and that's the question is does he want to go through another rebuild? Because if you remember when the Rockets got him in that trade mm-hmm. with Oklahoma City, it wasn't a rebuild of sorts, but it was a retool of the rebuild from the Kevin Martin era. One of my favorite Rockets oh, of yeah. all time. Oh yeah. Mainly because I'm a three point guy, so that 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 worked well for me. You used him in 2K a lot, didn't you? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a matter of whether or not James Harden wants to be a part of a rebuild, and that's kind of the same thing with Zion Williamson, and that's the same thing for if the CP3 rumors and pick up any more steam again. They've kind of died off, so I'm not thinking it's going to happen. Uh, but I don't know that these star players, especially those later on in their career, CP3, James Harden. I don't know if they want to be a part of another rebuild. And I think Zion Williamson, for him, for one, he just wants to get back onto the court. That's been a whole issue for, what, almost two years now? That's been an issue? It's it, uh, To me, it's been an issue ever since he got drafted out of Duke. Right. Like, he, he has spent less time on the court and more time on the injured reserve because he just can't stay healthy. And, you know, one thing I saw yesterday is that if he's going to get traded, it, there's got to be a lot of leverage. That comes on the other side of that, and I mean a top three pick. And oh, yeah. right now, my eyes on Charlotte and Portland. Yeah, with those two top three picks that they have. So, if he's going to get traded, it's going to be for that. Will it happen? Because I personally, I don't think he should stay in New Orleans because it's obviously not getting him anywhere. But then there's another side of that coin where he hasn't really 
had a chance to prove himself mm-hmm. in New Orleans because he's been hurt. Right. So we, I said that the ball's in the court for Harden. To me, I think the ball's in the court of the Pelicans right now if they want to keep their star player. Well, it is. And there were some reports I saw yesterday online that, uh, and I forget who first reported it, but basically saying that the relationship between Zion and the Pelicans is non-existent. Hmm. And that, according to Brian Windhorst, he said this about five or six days ago, I believe, on ESPN, that he would not be surprised, or he would be very shocked if uh, Zion Williamson is still on the Pelicans past tomorrow. So we'll have to see what comes up with that uh, and see if he stays on the Pelicans past tomorrow, if he gets traded tonight, and like a midnight deal of sorts, quote-unquote, but... He's not thinking that that Zion's going to be in New Orleans that much longer. Then with the whole Portland thing, for example, I think it'd be a good fit because it would give Damian Lillard his best second piece since LaMarcus Aldridge. Yeah. And with Damian Lillard saying that he's going to stay in Portland, but they need to win. They need to build an actual roster that gets them to the finals, if not win it. That's your first kind of piece in showing Damian Lillard, hey, we're with you. We want to build a champion. We don't want to just kind of coast like we've been doing for most of our existence, minus the Clyde the Glide Drexler era. Yeah. But after that, really, you've just kind of been coasting. Well, you mentioned Windhorse, and this is what he said yesterday uh, in regards to Damian Lillard, and I'm quoting him here. He said, quote, Dame does not want a young movement. He wants to play with veterans. He wants the team to upgrade fast and immediately with veteran players that can help him now. And now, would you classify Zion as a veteran player? I believe, what was it? He was drafted in 2018, I if I remember correctly. So. If you want to fact check me on that. Yeah. Now, remember, Portland holds the number three pick tomorrow night. And that could be valuable in a trade to bring back veteran help to Portland if the Blazers if the Blazers want to go that way. 2019, 2019. number one pick in the draft from Dave by that's the right. Pelicans. That's right. So he's 22 years old. So that's not, there's no, yeah. He's not quite there The yet. only reason you would bring him in as part of that is because of the caliber, caliber player that he could be. Everybody knew that this guy's a freak athlete. He showed it in college. He started to show it in in the NBA with the Pelicans before he started with his injury history. Um, And then, of course, all the issues that he's had for the last season, season and a half, where he's had just has not been able to get back on the court besides a tiny little, yeah, kind of one-on-one, maybe, if that shooting practice, but that's about it. Um, So really, I don't know. I don't think that – I don't think we're going to see Zion Williams – in a trailblazer uniform, I think it'd be interesting. But I think, like you said, you're going to see a lot more veteran guys. I think that could be a situation where you see a James Harden get traded to Portland to be his number two with PG as a number one, because or not PG, with Damian Lillard as a number one, because obviously Chris Paul's not going there. You're not bringing in CP3 as a, as a two guard. No. You will bring in James Harden as a two guard and put him back at his original position, whereas right now he's a point guard with the Sixers. But again, like you said, Sixers might work out the deal. So that, I think a lot of this free agency is going to be dependent on what happens with James Harden, oddly enough. Uh, I think something else that you kind of have to watch for as well, this doesn't affect this offseason, but it affects, I believe, next year's offseason, Jalen Brown with the Celtics. Mm. A lot of people are saying he's due for that contract extension, and he is. He's one of the top two best players with the Celtics right now. It's a matter of whether or not the Celtics are going to fork up the money and give him the reported, I want to say it's like a $295 million extension that I think a lot of people are evaluating at. Something along those lines. And so that's the question is, are the Celtics going to pay him? And if not, you may see some of these teams, i.e. Houston, or some other teams who may be trying to rebuild, maybe see about not going after somebody this offseason to try to pursue Jalen Brown. Now, if you do that, there's a situation of what happens with your best player on the team. Yeah. With that scenario, 
probably move another one. And Maybe. then you take Porter as either as a six man or you trade him for a draft pick if you don't think it's working out or if you feel like switch it and and keep your best player as the two. Put Jalen Brown as a one and then go from there. Because you have to remember, Jalen Brown, he's not that young. No. He's close. He's rounding out about 30. Mm-hmm. So he's getting close. He's not exactly 30, but he's rounding out about that age. Well, one thing that I think is also really going to impact this offseason is how this draft is going to pan out Yeah. tomorrow night. So we can start talking about, of course, <laughs> one of the more highlight points of the summer, <laughs> the NBA draft tomorrow night. Uh, 8 Eastern, 7 Central on ESPN, ABC, and the app. And, uh, well, we know one thing is for certain is that San Antonio is going to take Victor Wembanyama without a doubt, a 19-year-old French phenom. And whenever the draft lottery came out and we were all wondering, hmm, who's going to land in that spot? Is it going to be the Rockets? Is it going to be the Hornets, the Spurs? Yeah. And, well, unfortunately for Houston, San Antonio landed with that one spot. And I, I, I don't think there's been a more clean-cut and dry number one overall pick, at least since, <laughs> oddly enough, Zion. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I mean, it's I was I was very dis, I was very not disappointed. They don't get to choose what pick, but yeah, I was upset when the Rockets didn't get the number one because going into it, they were the favorites to land that one, and the fact that they went all the way to four in that lottery was what shocked me the most. Uh, But, again, like you said, the Spurs are going to get him with the number one, clear, concise pick, and a very, very young talent that they can build around. And Popovich can basically make as his next Tim Duncan. Yeah. Because why not? (laughs) Why not? He has the experience. He's built him before. He can replicate the same stuff. And all you got to get is a guy who can bring the ball down and dish properly and get a guy who can – shoot three pointers until he's 47 years old and hey you've basically rebuilt the Ginobili uh Parker and Duncan era yeah and what an era that was yeah and so looking at the latest uh mock drafts that I've seen I've bounced around a couple of them I looked at SB Nation I looked at ESPN and I'm looking at ESPN's right now uh so when Banyama goes number one Mm -hmm. Charlotte with the second pick albeit that they don't trade it right Brandon Miller from Alabama, the sharpshooter that he is, could fall right in their lap. Interesting. I I mean, obviously, you know you're not going to get Wimbayano, so it's just a matter of, you know, do you take Miller? You know, and I'm looking at the same mock drafts as well on ESPN. Scoot Scoot Henderson at number three point guard. At this point, your owner just sold the team. Your whole franchise is rebuilding, so, you know, yeah, at this point, you kind of have your options open. You're rebuilding the team. You got new owners in who are going to completely want to put their stamp on everything. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of one of those things where you've got an open court. There's not a specific spot you absolutely have to get. It's just a matter of best available and see if they can become your centerpiece. I, I think I think if they go with either one, I think it's a great pick for them. Is you know, you know, Brandon Miller, aside from all the off court controversy, right? Heck of a player, you know, watching him at Alabama. And then, you know, I haven't seen a whole lot of out of Scoot Henderson, but from what I have seen out of what he's done with G League Ignite, it's been really good. So but I think whoever the Hornets decide to take, the other one in question is gonna fall right into the lap of Portland. Uh so it's it's kinda like the uh Bryce Young, CJ Stroud kind of thing. Right. Whoever was taken first. The next guy's going second. So it's the same thing here with the two and the three. And now the more important one for at least you and me as Rockets fans. (laughs) Who are they going to take at number four? ESPN says, and so did SB Nation, they said Amen Thompson from Overtime Elite, the the really, really good young guard. Yeah, I mean, he's got a lot of good physical talent. He's a lockdown defender, uh, and he's got a good combination of kind of playmaking skills and scoring in the open court. But... You know, it's going to be a matter of, okay, you put him in the slot, and, I mean, let's go ahead and just look at, you know, the Rockets kind of right now, and you look at the depth chart, and now you, all of a sudden you got him competing with Kevin Porter Jr. Somehow DJ Augustine is on the roster. <laughs> I keep forgetting that's a thing. 
He's still he's, playing? He's on. He's third on the depth chart, though, so that, yeah. But <laughs> point being, he's easily going to leapfrog him, and he's going to easily leapfrog, leapfrog Jock uh, Landale, the, basically the backup to Kevin Porter Jr. So you basically got a competition at your one between Kevin Porter Jr. and, and uh, Amin Thompson, or Amen Thompson, Amen Corner, whichever. <laughs> this isn't golf. Oh, come on, the Masters. I know. <laughs> but the point being, it's nice to have all these young pieces if you're Houston, but at some point you have to stop being young. Right, I think he'd be a good pick, but at the same time, I don't know that just continuing to get more, you know, young guys, more young guys, more young guys. Sure, okay, that's fine. But at the same time, you've got to have, like you mentioned earlier, get some veteran guys in the locker room to try and do something. Because right now, your most veteran guys in the locker room, DJ Augustine. And Frank Kaminsky the third. Well, you know, I'm, well, it's not just them too. I was, I'm looking at the roster right now as well. The only guys on this roster that were born in the 1980s, right? DJ Augustine, he's the oldest guy on the team. Um, Boban Marjanovic. <laughs> and oh man, those are the only two guys from the 1980s. The only other ones, Willie Cauley Stein, who. Electric in college, but I don't know yeah. if it's really translated to the NBA since he got there. Not really. Frank Kaminsky, as you mentioned, of course, yeah. a lot of great experience. Um, and Jay Sean Tate. So, I like him. I, I do too. But we need that. I, I wouldn't say we I – would, I would say we just need that star power that we once had. Yeah. If it, we can find that one guy. And I, I know there's guys on the roster, the younger guys that are starting to become that – that's what I'm hoping Jabari Smith turns into, Jalen Green, of course, and, of course, Kevin Porter Jr. and Kenyon Martin Jr. So you're hoping they turn into that star power that you once had, like with, that you had with Harden, Chris Paul, and even, I'll even go further back, Tracy and Yao. <sighs> Such a great era. Because mm-hmm. the thing is, too, with those rosters, the main thing that made them successful is they had depth and they had very, very good role players. Steve Franchise Francis, mm-hmm. Rafer Alston, Trevor Ariza, both times, mm-hmm. Shane Battier, yep. Bonzi Wells, Aaron Brooks, Kyle Lowry, who is tearing it up ever since he left Houston. <laughs> I mean, you have all of these guys, and there's plenty more that I am not putting on there, including Bob Sura mm-hmm. from the old ESPN 2K5 game. <laughs> <laughs> he could shoot the lights out from three. Yeah, he could. In 2K. Yeah, he could. But, I mean, there's th- that's the thing with Houston. Since the turn of the century and even during the, the two championships in the middle 90s, mid- mid-90s, it's depth is what made these rosters and what made them so good. It made them continuous perennial playoff guys. Now, if the Rockets are basically saying that they're a few free agent signings away from maybe contending for the playoffs. I think that's a bit of a stretch, in my opinion, because with the guys you have right now, you're still last in the conference and still one of the worst teams in all of basketball. But you're never going to get better if all you do is just kind of draft rookies and hope that they turn out to be something. You have to still rely on the old guys that are still in the league right now. And that's why I feel that getting James Harden would help a lot because you put him at the one, you put Porter as a six man, you got Jay Sean Tate and Tari Eason as your seven and eight guys. That rotation I would feel a lot better of. I'm going to be honest, I think Kenyon Martin Jr. is probably not it at that three spot. I think you either need to go get somebody or you slide in Jay Sean Tate. Uh, a, until you get somebody in a trade or get somebody in free agency. But I think getting somebody at the three, I think, would help your depth, but then just help your starting lineup in general. And then I think if you do trade for James Harden and you pull it off, you got to put him at the one. But getting James Harden means you're going to have to give up some of these top players. It, it, it's going to take a haul to get him back to Houston, and you have a lot of young talent. Yeah. That you can ship off to Philadelphia because you know I know I know Philadelphia is still trying to figure out 
Uh, how do we how do we get back to uh, relevancy? Right. Um, so we'll see what happens there, you know, and I'm excited for how this draft's going to pan out. There's a lot of guys that I watched at the college level that are going to be coming up, like Jairus Walker from U of H. Uh, people say he's going to end up in Detroit. Um, Taylor Hendricks at UCF, he could end up in Indiana. Anthony Black from Arkansas and Washington. Cam Whitmore is somebody I'm surprised that has fallen down a lot of boards, the right. small forward from Villanova. Uh, ESPN has him at nine going to the to the Jazz. And then uh, just to shout out, you know, some of our colleagues' favorite team, the <laughs> Dallas Mavericks. Uh, ESPN has them taking Derek Lively, the second out of Duke, a center mm-hmm. at that to try and compliment Luca. Or uh, SB Nation says Taylor Hendricks was going to fall to them at the number ten spot. So it'll be interesting to see how it pans out with uh, the NBA draft again tomorrow night, eight p.m. Eastern, seven p.m. Central, ESPN, ABC. And the ESPN app. <sighs> All right. I think it's time we take a break. <laughs> yeah, probably. We, uh, we move on to our next <laughs> segment. We're going to talk uh, one of the last remaining uh, ongoing sports things going on right now, besides the Major League Baseball season. It's the College World Series, and it's going to be very, very exciting finish. And I'll talk. we'll talk about that coming up after this. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the K-Sam Sports Podcast. I'm Carlos Zimmerman. Alongside of me, of course, my good friend and broadcast partner and co-host Jordan Smith. Just got done talking about the NBA. Now time to talk about the College World Series, one of the greatest spectacles in all of collegiate sports, really all sports for that. Of course, you got your college football playoff, March right. Madness, and, of course, the College World Series. And I, I love watching it every single year. It's been and This year has been rather special with the, uh, the entire, really, NCAA regionals, of course, yeah. with Sam Houston making and we'll talk about that in our last segment of the day. Mm-hmm. And But looking at this College World Series, what a matchup Monday night between LSU and Wake Forest. Two teams that I touted as juggernauts and teams that could definitely find their way to making the College World Series a final. The game did not disappoint. Back and forth between the two teams at one point. Then the pitching started to come out. And then right there at the end, in the bottom of the eighth, Bennett Levy, it wasn't it wasn't a walk off, but it felt like a walk off. The right. go ahead RBI single to put Wake Forest in front for good, and then letting their bullpen take care of things in the top of the ninth. Great game. It wasn't like Carl Ravage calling a home run in the top of the ninth. Oh my goodness! <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, "Look, <sighs> Carl Ravage, great broadcaster in his own right, mm-hmm. but it happens to the best of us." Yeah, it, it does. It really it does. does. I've I've done it before. But yeah. you you got <laughs> to be situationally aware of where you're at in the ball game. Right. I get the excitement. It was a very cool moment. Plus, it's Omaha. And it's Omaha. Yeah. You're absolutely right. But <laughs> it's okay, Carl. You're probably not watching this, but no. it's okay. If you are, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes to all of you as well. Remember, yeah. subscribe. We're going to be putting out a lot more on this channel, more than just the podcast and stuff yeah. like that. we got a lot of great stuff planned yeah. for this fall. But, again, what a game for Wake Forest, the number one overall seed. Uh, it's easy to go with them as an odds-on favorite to win the whole thing, as it is with every sport with a number one seed. But we've come to realize with collegiate sports over the last few years that being a number one seed, frankly, does not matter. No. So the question now becomes – Who's going to take it all at this point? I mean, it, it, it's gone every which way. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think really every team that made the CWS had an opportunity to win the whole thing. But obviously, I'm sticking with my pick, Wake Forest, to, to go with the whole thing. And wouldn't that be cool for an ACC program like that of Wake Forest to get it done? It wouldn't be bad. Probably wouldn't be as exciting, but it wouldn't be no. bad. <laughs> The number one wins it, yeah, especially after last year, where literally the last team picked for the college for for the NCAA baseball tournament, not just college, but the NCAA baseball tournament, and Ole Miss winning the whole thing. That was exciting. That was true Cinderella. Mm-hmm. This year, I feel like one of the two teams in the final. They may not win it. But one of the two teams in the final is that same team that was the very last pick in the NCAA baseball tournament. Winners of the Big 12 program. I regrettably have TCU getting to the final. <laughs> and he, folks, he says regrettably because he spent time at Baylor. 
Yep. Doing his undergrad there before he left and went to Sam. And I grew up a UT kid. And so. you grew up a UT kid, so <laughs> it's almost blasphemy, <laughs> which is really ironic saying blasphemy to pick right. Texas Christian to yeah. win this whole thing. I mean, I mean, I I, I wouldn't argue against it because yeah. I mean, it's a Power Five program, and I, I did a little di- bit of digging on this. Uh, they didn't get to the College World Series in, until 2010 mm-hmm. when they were in the Mountain West, and they have steadily become a big factor in baseball ever since. Yeah, in the last 13, 14 years or so, they have really turned it around to become one of the best continuous programs in all of college baseball, uh, and especially in the Big 12. They're usually always right there at the top. Uh, in the Big 12 when it comes to baseball. Um, But, yeah, I mean, really, TCU's biggest thing for me, they have to get past Florida. Now, I will say this. I had Florida going 1-2 and in this College World Series. I didn't think they were going to make it past a second elimination game. I thought they would lose the first game to Virginia, who I had as a sleeper, to make a underdog run to the final. And then Florida win against probably Oral Roberts in that first elimination game and then lose to probably Virginia in that second elimination game. That's how I had Florida. They're all the, they're playing, you know, later today. Uh playing later today at, at one o'clock our time. So Obviously, they did better than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> Which I had talked to a couple people, and they were like, yeah, I don't know why you're saying they're going to be out by the third game. That makes zero sense. But as long as TCU can get past Florida, then, hey, we're good. But that's the problem. They have to get past TCU. Mm-hmm. The two seed in the entire uh, country, not easy to do. Best team out of the SEC and in my opinion, at least, and I think in a lot of people's opinion, people's opinions, at least, and that's why they were the number two seed in all of this. But you look at the other side too. There's a couple other SEC teams as well that uh, that were in this College World Series. My other team is a team from the SEC, and it's probably the best bullpen in all of college baseball in Tennessee. The Vols, especially, led out of that bullpen by Jordan Davis. Holy cow, that kid can touch 102 off the mound just because he wants to. Mm -hmm. And then he can drop it off to about 92. It's insane. And, well, you look at the other side of that other SEC school, LSU. We got to see that full frontal with Sam Houston. And arguably have the number one starting pitcher in the country and the guy who's probably going to go number one in the MLB draft in in Dylan Cruz. Mm Mm-hmm. Nothing to sleep on there. And so I, I think it could go every which way. The, could this be another year that the SEC just absolutely dominates the College World Series with Ole Miss winning last year? Or does somebody else like that of a Big 12 program in TCU or an ACC program in Wake Forest, do they get to wear the crown? Right, right. It's going to be fun to watch. I mean, it it is every year. It's it's Omaha. and. I'm sticking with Wake Forest because I, I know it's not the sexy pick. Mm-hmm. I know it's not. But I, I saw this stat pop up, and it's from a colleague of ours, Jack Benjamin. He tweeted this one out. Um, Bennett Lee, who got the go-ahead RBI single right. against uh, – why am I blinking? <laughs> against uh, – <laughs> In the Hol- first game, Stanford, in- right? No, no. Uh, against LSU. Why, oh, okay. why, why was why was I blanking on that? Jeez, Louise, the heat's getting to me. <laughs> um, yeah, it probably is. He spent 2021-2022 uh, with Tulane. Okay. Which is ironic, another team that was uh, that made the right. NCAA regionals this year, which was in Sam Houston's region. Also a 19-40 and 40 record. Yeah, because w- what is baseball? <laughs> so his career at – his year at Tulane, he was American Athletic Conference first team. Freshman All-American, a 1.127 OPS. Mm -hmm. Very good. 440 batting average. And then this year at Wake Forest, his stats dip a little bit, going 915 on OPS, 309 Mm -hmm. on the batting average. But that night against LSU, he went two for three, the game-saving 
pick and tag prior to his game-winning RBI single right. in the eighth. And I think he's going to be the pure catalyst that launches Wake Forest to a college World Series title. And I'm going to have to do some quick research real quick here. I don't, I don't believe Wake Forest... Jeopardy music has ever. Uh, you want to edit that in? Be my guest. <laughs> I don't know if that would get copyrighted or not, but I'm not. They even have it. not won an NCAA tournament since 1955. Their only NCAA championship. That seems pretty recent. This is their first <laughs> appearance in the College World Series since 1955. Holy cow! I mean, hey, if you're gonna up here, you may as well be the best one. Yeah. When you're doing it, you know. I mean, and they they've done well. You know, they have their game later tonight uh, in that bracket two final, uh, beating Stanford three two, beating LSU three two, and the two games leading up to the game tonight. You know, it's it's been a very good run uh, for Wake Forest. I wouldn't be surprised if they just went ahead and decided to win it tonight and be done with it and move on and get to the final. But again, watch watch for that losers bracket. Watch to see because I again I feel like it's Tennessee. It's it's a very, very top-heavy college world series this year, to say the least. Yeah, it, a lot of a great pool of talent that I and I think there's a lot of names that we've talked about thrown out there, like Dylan Cruz, Bennett Lee. We're going to be talking about it for years to come when they are wearing Major League Baseball uniforms. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. Well, I mean, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to go to the pro side of things now, and we're going to talk about what's going on with Houston, and. We have a problem. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> as much as I hate to admit it, I think there is a problem. Plus, we'll look at the total landscape of all of Major League Baseball when we come back after this here on the KSAM Sports Podcast. Welcome back on the KSAM Sports Podcast. Jordan Smith here alongside me is Carlos Zimmerman as we dive into the world of my favorite sport, the MLB, and just everything baseball. At least the pro stuff, that is, because we just talked about College World Series. Now we move on, and let's start with the hometown, at least for us hometown, Houston Astros. You said it before the break, Carlos. Houston, they've got a problem. Uh huh. They, they've got a, a major problem. Things have been sliding in the worst way possible for them. I mean, even taking a look at the standings for them, they're in third place. Somehow, they're behind the Angels in the division, a game and a half behind. The more shocking thing for me, and we'll get into this a little bit later on in this segment, the Rangers still atop the AOS, six and a half games ahead. That's not, that's not a regular stretch. That is, that is a good, sizable lead. But focusing on the Astros specifically, first... What's going on? Because I've got nothing. I, I, I've i struggled to figure out what the problem is. Now, I, I, I know we, we there's a little bit of an injury bug that's going on with Houston right now. It I, seems like the whole season has been. I know. Your Keaty's on the shelf. Um, your, pro, your top prospect that you have highly touted for so many years who can't stay healthy, worth a crap, in Forrest Whitley. Um, Jordan, of course, the big one that you don't have out there right now. Literally and figuratively. Literally. And Michael Brantley, who's been on the shelf all year. And now I know this isn't as significant now, which is weird to say, but Lance McCullers is also being out for the rest of the year and out until probably the midway point of next season. And you don't have Luis Garcia either. And that's the thing. It's just like it's one injury after the other. As soon as Altuve comes back and things start working again, <laughs> Alvarez goes down. You 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 lose another pitcher. You bring some guys in and they've done well, but you know it's it's just for whatever reason it's not good enough. It just seems like one thing after the other continues to be the issue. Now I've seen a couple of these things online, and I don't understand because for me personally, I don't agree with this at all. But people are wondering if this is the fault uh, fault of the roster management by Dusty Baker. I don't agree with that. I I don't feel like it is either. I I don't think so much it, that Dusty's the problem. I think it's just he's doing the best he can with the personnel that he has out there. I mean, this is the Astros' starting rotation as of this moment. Right. Framber Valdez, Christian Javier, Hunter Brown, J.P. France, 
and Ronel Blanco. You look at that, three of those guys weren't even on Major League rosters a couple of years ago. Yeah. And, yeah, Fromber and Christian are good, but you don't have your guys like your Kitty and Garcia to compliment them. And I, I intentionally leave McCullers off of that because I, I just – my my opinion on him right now is in the crapper, if you will. Yeah, it, it, and I get that. I get that. It, with, with me, I I'm a huge McCullers guy, right? But I also realize that right now at this moment in his career, his spot is not in that starting rotation. If you look at compared to like you said today's rotation, he's probably the number three guy. Yeah, but what's best in my opinion for his career right now? is to become a long reliever, work on keeping some kind of durability and not being injured all the time, but also use him as a long reliever. Because you saw when he came back and was a starter, he wasn't consistent. Granted, he was still trying to come off of, uh, I believe it was the Tommy John surgery, so he was still trying to work back from that. But even then, I I really feel like he's best right now, like we see with Colin McHugh. Out in uh, Atlanta, for example, uh, he even did it with the Red Sox a little bit, where he was mostly a starter, but you also saw him as a long reliever, and I think that would be a good role for Lance Colors as well. I will say though, JP France has done pretty well: mm-hmm. two and two record in eight starts, three forty two ERA, and forty seven of the third innings with thirty eight strikeouts. Not a bad, you know, simple stat line for him. Uh, you know, so far through his limited time in the major leagues. I think he has done what's needed so far to keep himself as that number three guy. I don't think you're going to see him move up or down anytime soon. But, and this is something that I talked to you and a, a couple of our, of our friends about. This past offseason, I really feel like the Astros missed the ball, and I feel like they needed to get an arm. Not because Justin Verlander left, slightly, but we didn't need a player of Verlander's caliber because you're not going to find that right now. It's very hard to find somebody who, even at that age, more or less, is going to pitch as well as he did last season, winning his Cy Young and getting his second World Series. That's not going to happen. But for me, I feel like the Astros needed to get another arm in that starting rotation because I had, I had that bad feeling in my knee that we didn't have enough. We didn't have enough in that rotation. And with the injuries, I'm not saying that injuries have made me correct, but we're seeing it. You mentioned the rotation right now. There's not enough guys in there that you can feel confident about if you're the Houston Astros saying, these are our guys long term. You've got three at most right now in that rotation. And I don't think it stops at the rotation. I think it blends into the bullpen as well. Right. Because at least from what I saw in the series with Cincinnati, Mm -hmm. I don't think it was really on the starters. The bullpen couldn't get them back into the game. I mean, and part of that's on the offense too, but I mean, what happened to Phil Maton in that series? Ryan, (laughs) what happened to Ryan Stanek? Hector Neris is just doing what he can. And then, you know, here's another guy that's really falling off is Rafael Montero. Yeah. He, he's been rather disappointing lately. Like, when, when you have four of your main workhorses in the bullpen and they're not quite where they need to be right now when your best guy right now is your closer, mm-hmm. there's a problem. So I really think it st- stems through the entire pitching staff, and yeah. that is not on Dusty whatsoever. It's a matter of the personnel that you have in there. You're shorthanded right now, yeah. and it goes back to your point. You didn't get that other arm that you needed in the offseason, so what do you do now? you probably go at the deadline. You have to. And find somebody who, someone who's selling mm-hmm. and get one of their workhorse arms to be in your rotation on, at least until you can get your kitty back. Well, here's something. the thing. You need two arms. You need a bullpen guy and you need a starter. If you're looking at their arms, you need both. And the question then becomes, who do you give up? You're going to have to give up some prospects, and if I'm the Astros, I'm probably giving up Belak because he just got optioned to to bring up, I forget, I think it was Dubin, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was Sean Dubin, yes. Um, who just recently came up with the Astros in the last few days. Um, but I think you trade Belak 
to go get a bullpen arm and give them, you know, draft pick or some kind of capital I, or whatever. But at that point, I feel like you you have to get a bullpen arm. Like you mentioned, the bullpen hasn't been great as of late. And uh, even going into yesterday's game, they had a five-game losing streak. Mm -hmm. The series uh, getting swept against the Reds, losing the first game uh, against the Mets just a couple of days ago on Monday, and then mm -hmm. losing the last game against the Nationals last week. So going into yesterday, like I said, five game losing streak. So it's it's not a good look right now. And I think part of it, you mentioned it earlier, is the injuries that we've had, uh, especially Jordan. We need we desperately need him back right now. You, you need a power back. I mean, that's one yeah. thing we haven't talked about yet. But one one touch on the uh, assets that we ought to trade. Yeah, this is a very unpopular opinion, uh, at least amongst Astros fans. But I've held this for quite a while. Okay. If you want a leverage player to throw into a deal to get an arm here to Houston, I think you got to put Forrest Whitley on the block. I, I think so, too. I, For me, and I've talked with um, one of my friends who's a pretty much baseball expert. He's That's that's his thing. He's a baseball coach. I knew exactly who you're talking yep. about. He, he, he knows the game. He played it in high school. He was recruited in college to some Power 5 schools. He was he was a good pitcher. He knows the game. I was talking with him, but I said, at what point, and he's a huge Forrest Whitley fan, and I said, at what point do we stop giving him excuses and realize he's going to need to get traded? The problem is right now, I don't think any team is going to look at him and go, yeah, we'll, we'll get him. Why not? Because of his injury history. And I think that's part of the problem because – he came back and he started. He had a couple of good starts with with Sugarland, and then he got hurt again. And that that's probably he can't stay that's, healthy. That's the unfortunate thing about it is now he's become an albatross on the team yeah. that you can't get rid of him because no one's going to want him. You just got to hope that maybe you sucker someone in and look at you know you know this is what he used to be. And I think that oh, it, maybe he's on a track. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is a tra <laughs> Vegas. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> this could be a track of where he can be again. He's right. on track to be what he was when we drafted him. Right. So that's what you got to hope that you, you know, like I said, you sucker someone in and you hopefully they're able to take the bait on it. Yeah. Now, will, is the potential that it could backfire on the Astros? Absolutely. He could turn into, you know, the next big thing. Yeah. Now that he got – but to me, I think it's time. We've we've had him for so long in our system, and he hasn't made his way up yet. We, I think it's time to put him on the block and see who we can try and get for him. So, But I know we've talked a lot about the pitching. we got we got to look at the offense too. Yeah, I think – and a lot of people are going to look at first base. And they're going to look at Jose Abreu and say, see, this is why you should have brought back Yuli, who's tearing it up in Miami this year. And I don't necessarily disagree, but I don't necessarily agree either. I was fine with either one. I would have loved to see Yuli come back. I love the fact that Jim Crane, the owner slash de facto GM at the moment, well, I guess not really because they have Dana Brown, but you basically Jim Crane is <laughs> the one really pulling he's, the moves. He's pulling the strings. He's pulling the strings. He's kind of Jerry Jones in it a little bit. Not as much. Don't, com but don't compare him. <laughs> Am I wrong? Don't compare him. Am my I wrong? I, don't compare my Crane to, to – I'm a Texans fan and an Astros fan as well. I'm Houston until the day I die. I know. In other words, lanes are covered. Bury me in the H. But I'm not wrong. No, you, you got a point. <laughs> so – you know, the thing is with that especially is it wasn't a good or bad move to go get a Brayu. It was the right move for the right time. Based on the optics and the way the Astros front office works, I don't think they were expecting Yuli Gurriel, even though he was coming off the batting title, to do what he's done so far this year. I think they were going to start to see a little bit of regression and the thing is, too, a lot of people think that the Astros didn't do anything to try to get him. There was a contract offered to Yuli Gurriel. But in the contract, and the main reason why Yuli did not come back is because Yuli said, if I come back, I'm a starter. And the Astros, who had already signed a Abreu, said, we can't do that. We can't guarantee that. And that is the only reason 
why Yuli is not in the blue and orange right now and is in the neon and whatever else he's got. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's something that a lot of people are going to look at. Um, I think a lot of people, you, you, I don't know if you've heard it or not, but I've heard it a lot too. The conversation with what's happening at catcher. I think a lot of people are saying that that Dusty's hanging on a little too much to to Maldi being in the starting road, the starting lineup almost every single day, which I don't disagree with. But at the same time, Maldi is one of the best defensive catchers in all of baseball. And yeah, a catcher's not supposed to be an offensive guy. No. So for me, if I can get him, now granted, we've seen from the other catchers, they've got. They've got some good arms. They got some good defense behind them as well. Yeah, Andrew Diaz is a very serviceable catcher. Very serviceable. And if Corey Lee doesn't work out, who was supposed to be the next big catcher superstar for the Astros, best catcher probably since Osmus. You've got Yonder Diaz, who is proving right now that he's not a he's not a bad substitute for that spot. And I think honestly, you might see this being the last season for Moldy in Houston. I I, I agree. I I. He, Either he goes to another team or, you know, he, maybe he'll call it quits. He, this is his 13th year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, catchers, those knees, they tear up pretty quick. Yeah. So I, I think he may just call it a career after this year, a great one at that. But to your point about, you know, people saying that he shouldn't be in the lineup, no, this is what my argument for him being in the lineup. And it's to one of your points. You're not. You don't expect your catcher to be a primary producer in the lineup. That's why you see them batting eighth or ninth in the order. It's not his fault that he's not a great batter. It, that's just that comes with the territory of the position. If mm-hmm. you want production in your lineup, get it from your three, four, and five. And we haven't yeah. been getting that lately. Yeah. So it's not Maldi's fault. It's the guys in the middle of the order that are supposed to be your producers, like that of Kyle Tucker, of mm-hmm. Alex Bregman. I, I know Altuve's coming off of the injury, so he's mm-hmm. still trying to get back into the swing of things, if you will. And that of Jose Abreu as well, who started to turn a corner. I know I was a bit skeptical about him when he first came up, but uh, came to the Astros, I should say. But he started to turn the corner on both on all fronts, really. I think one thing, and this kind of leads into the last question I have here about the Astros, about how they kind of fix it. I don't think you're going to start seeing this thing fixed until Michael Brantley gets back. Mm. Oddly enough, and I say this, and I'm going to compare this to another Houston team. The Houston Rockets. The only reason, in my opinion, they even got to the Western Conference Finals against the Warriors and were a hamstring away of Chris Paul's from making it to the Finals that will haunt me for the rest of my life Mm -hmm. is not CP3. It's not James Harden. It wasn't even Clint Capella, who... I don't think was even on the team at that point, but would have been had they not traded him to Atlanta. It was Trevor Ariza, the veteran, the glue of the locker room, and a guy who had won championships out with the Lakers before coming back to Houston. He was the absolute glue of that team, and the whole reason, in my opinion, why they were able to even make that run to the Western Conference Finals. Same reason here. Michael Brantley is the Astros' Trevor Ariza. They do not win without him. We're seeing that right now unfold in plain sight. We've seen it since he came to the Astros. Exactly. I feel like nothing is going to change until Brantley gets back. Now, hoping he gets better soon and he's able to start actually doing more activities. He's been starting to have a little bit of batting practice, a little bit of fielding practice before some of these games as of late. So it's a good sign. But I feel like the Astros aren't going to turn it around until Michael Brantley is back in that lineup. I think once you see him back in that lineup and sitting out in left field or wherever, I think you're going to see a huge change and a huge motivational and confidence boost in this Astros lineup. And then, I, in my opinion, yes, I agree with you. We need Brantley back. But uh, the other thing is getting Jordan back as well. Right. You need that power bat back in your lineup because I'm looking up and down the lineup right now. There's really, outside of maybe Kyle Tucker, there's not really that threatening lefty batter in your order. Not a not a 40 home run guy. No. no. You, you need your you – 
dare I say it, you need your, you know, big poppy back yeah. in the order. You do. So you do. if we can get him back too, once Brantley comes back, I think the team will start turning around. And folks, before we transition to state of the Major League Baseball, it's a long season still. Yeah. We are nearing the halfway point, but there's a lot of games still to be played. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of dynamics in at least the Astros division that are still not yet seen yet. Yeah, has there been a hot start for the Texas Rangers? And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But don't lose hope on the Astros just yet. I saw this on Instagram this uh, uh, yesterday morning. Uh, you remember in 2005 when we wrote off the Ast- they uh, Chronicle wrote off the Astros at 15 and 30. Yep. Well, they made a parody. Uh, one of the parody accounts uh, made that. Oh gosh. And it literally carbon copy the Astros season, April 2023 to June 2023. <laughs> I think they're just trying to bring out a good omen because I, look, at look, this look, point, look, yeah. Look, look, look what they did in 2005. I don't care that we got swept in the World yeah. Series. I've caught myself watching old clips of that just to. You know, I don't know why I'm doing it. It's just depressing to watch. Nostalgia. It, it, yeah, nostalgia sake. It's so. when we were winning baseball games. Yeah. <laughs> do, not, <laughs> do not quit on Houston just yet. I think there's a turnaround in this team. and I sure hope so. The defending champs, I don't think they're going to miss out on another opportunity to defend their title. So I said this to another friend of ours um, before the season. This was the last point before we transition. I said, as much as I hate to say it, and I, born and born and bled Astros guy. My grandfather got me to the Astros. That's that's all of it. Been going to games since they opened what was Enron Field in two thousand. <laughs> Missed out on the Astrodome, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, as much as I hate to say it, and as much as Astros fans may want to deny it, maybe not right now. But I said going into this season, not during, going into the season, this is the last year of the golden era. I think when Verlander left, obviously it was sad, but you can kind of start to feel this is the start of the end. Bregman may be a guy who's leaving soon. Uh, he, he said he wants to stay, but it's going to be a matter of can we afford him? Because you have to remember... Altuve is going to get that contract. He's oh, yeah, going he's, to get the contract no matter what happens to Bregman. He's an Astro for the rest of his career. Exactly. That's the guy they're going to take care of first. He's the new Craig Biggio. Exactly. Which is great because I love second base and Craig Biggio was my guy growing up. Yeah. So, point being, who knows what's going to happen with Bregman. I'd love to see him back in an Astros uniform, but it's going to be a matter of are they going to be able to afford him? And then you got to start thinking about how much longer are you going to be able to afford your done? Well, they've already given him the extension. That's right. So, That's right. So he's I mean, locked up for a bit, but you know, even then, it's I don't know. I just I feel like this is the probably the last year for that window to be open. I think afterwards, you kind of have to start looking at a not a rebuild. They're not there yet. But a retool of the of the lineup just to kind of keep stay competitive, I think. But I think this may be your last year for that golden era to to be open. I think heading into next off season, unless you pull a Mets and spend five hundred million dollars, which is not in Jim Crane's wheelhouse, as far as willingness to do so. This may be the last year for the Astros to get to complete the dynasty yeah. and get that third title. So looking at the state of Major League Baseball, let's start in the East. I know you're kind of surprised. I'm not as surprised that the Tampa Bay Rays have a 51-24 and record and are leading the AL West. And if I'm not mistaken, have the best record in all of Major League Baseball. Yes, they do. They have the best record in all of Major League Baseball, the first and only team to get to 50 games. That I'm not as surprised about. What surprises me about the rest of the division... <laughs> Who's right behind them? No, is the is the Yankees being at the three. I figured the Orioles would be better. I didn't think they would be 44-27, and 27, five games behind the Rays for second in the East good. I figured that was still... Next year, before they got to 20 games almost above 500. 
at what the middle of June. But the Yankees being at three is what surprises me at a thirty nine and thirty three record. The Red Sox they're trying to figure out their franchise. They're treading water at this point. The Blue Jays are trying to hang on to an experiment that's not working, which is grab every star's son from the last 35 years and hope it works. So, yeah, I'm not as surprised with the Rays being at one. I'm a little surprised with the Orioles being as far as they are in tune because right now they're five and a half games ahead of the Yankees. I mean, you look at, you know... (laughs) I, I just pulled up their starting rotation, and it's working for them. Oh, yeah. You got the Kyle show, Kyle Bradish <laughs> and Kyle Gibson. You got Cole Irvin, Dean Kramer, and Tyler Wells. They're doing all of this without John Means. Mm-hmm. Who, in my opinion, is kind of overrated. He's a good pitcher, but he's not as good as everybody thinks he is just because he threw that, that no-hitter. Mm-hmm. But anyways, continue. And – what really has driven Baltimore is that incre- incredible lineup. Mm-hmm. Adley Rutschman behind the plate. Adam Frazier. Gunnar Henderson. The resurgence of Ryan O'Hearn. Eat him up. <laughs> um, Ramon Urias. And then in that outfield, you got Austin Hayes and Anthony, Anthony Santander. That's a killer lineup if I've ever seen one. Yeah. It, there, there ain't a whole lot of sexy names in there. But uh, outside of maybe Adley Rutschman and uh, Gunnar Anderson, but it's a scary good team and very good team. Someone we'll see in October. Oh, absolutely! And I'm I'm very much looking forward to seeing the O's in October it's, to see how many people are going to hit a home run in the left field. That, that, <laughs> this is a matter of seeing the best team out of Baltimore yeah. since the 2014 2017 <sighs> era for Baltimore. That was a good run. That was a very good run. I can still hear, see, hear Camden Yards going crazy after that. Uh, Brian Anderson making the call. Uh, with the Delman Young yeah. hit. <laughs> yeah. So, so, it's exciting there. Looking at the Central. <laughs> Do we have to talk about this division? I, I don't want to talk about it too much. I don't want it to exist. <laughs> it's so bad. Minnesota has a losing record. Every team has a losing record. I know they do. <laughs> Every a, team. Jordan, we're in a small room. Relax. <laughs> Cleveland second, and Detroit <laughs> right there with Hinchy at the front, bringing it up there in third. And then White Sox are right there. Then there's Kansas City. Yeah. Um, man, what a fall from grace. Um, yeah. yeah, you're you're telling me. And, and I, if there's a nosedive of a franchise, it's that one. So. Yeah. No. Central is wide open right now. It, yeah. it could land every which way. Whoever wins it out of the Central, it doesn't matter. They're not going to win a playoff game this year. No. So that, that division doesn't even – Need the breath warranted on them. All right, let's talk the West. So, I kind of, not kind of, I do hate to say this, because obviously as an Astros fan, and you know this because you are as well, the Rangers are our biggest rival, right? Uh, Indeed. And you figured at some point they were going to get better than what they've had in the last five years. I didn't think it'd be this soon. I figured it wasn't going to start turning out to be anywhere close to this until next year when they had a couple more prospects up. But because of the free agent spending they did this past offseason, getting some arms, I hate to say it, you know, the question that I'm presenting is, do the Rangers, does their hot start kind of fizzle out at some point? As an Astros fan, you would hope. I'd love to say absolutely because I keep telling all our Rangers fans that it's going to. We're in the middle of June. They're still there. I don't think this is going away. I'm starting to get to that point where the Rangers may be, I don't want to say back in the West, but they're they're competing in the West again. This is all of a sudden a a division that four out of the five teams could win it because somehow the Angels are sitting at second in the West with a 41-33 and 33 record because they finally decided to start playing winning baseball and again. Seattle's not far behind Houston. Yeah. And they're sitting 500, but they want to get back to that postseason that they had last year. They're riding that high from making it to the postseason last year before we uh, kind of, you know, throat punch them. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jeremy Pena. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
18 but innings later. It, yeah. I, 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 we, I, we won't get into that because <laughs> I was in Utah that night. Yes, you um, were. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll talk about that coming up in our last segment. But a very they, they got a very potent lineup, yeah. you know, with Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon leading the charge. The thing is, they're doing all of this success on the at least on the pitching side of things without the golden boy that they got in the off season, mm-hmm. Degrom, and their top prospect is hurting Jack Leiter. So, see, okay, I've got a thing about Jack Leiter. I'm gonna be honest. I, I'm still fifty fifty on him. I'm not completely sold on Jack Leiter coming up and being the savior that all Rangers fans are saying that he's supposed to be. I, I don't think he's so much going to be the savior right now. I, I, I didn't think he was going to get called up this year. No, I but he was he was, he was the golden boy prospect. As you said, the number one prospect. He's the golden guy for the Rangers. I, I'm not 100% sold on him. Not just because of injuries, but I don't know. I bad Feeling my bad knee. It's coming up again. I... For whatever reason, and I have this feeling about him last year. I just, I don't feel like he's that franchise, I'm the answer guy. I think your franchise, the answer guy, was the guy you signed in the offseason in Jacob DeGrom, who's now hurt, unfortunately. But. And I'm still going to poke Rangers fans about that. Oh, yeah. You signed the guy, and he gets hurt. Yeah. But you're making it work. Yeah. Somehow they're making it work. So I guess technically you have to. Give I'll, I'll give props. Him an, I'll give him an ounce of credit. I'll go barf in the trash can. Where did that thing go? It's, it's over, over there. there. I'll I'll barf in that later. But yeah, I honestly, with the way this West is going right now, as much as I hate to say it, let's be real. This is the Rangers' division to lose. With the way this is shaping up, because with typical Angels fashion, they'll fall off. Even though Otani is literally leading every single team stat they're, category there is the, you in both pitching and hitting, and is probably going to win the MVP again this year. You cannot win a team sport of baseball with one player. Two at most with Trout and Otani. You can't do it with just you them two. Can't do it because and a fifty-fifty Anthony Rendon. And and you're and you're <laughs> hoping that they stay. What's the word? Healthy. Yep. <laughs> Seems to be a reoccurring theme. Uh huh. But. Because I I don't know that the Mariners are gonna make a push for the title. I think they might make a push for the wild card, but I think they miss out. Okay. I think I think this roster this year for the Mariners is a lot like that 2016 year for for the Houston Astros. Almost at Sam Houston for the Houston Astros. I think this year for Seattle was last year. Get a taste of the playoffs. Let's tweak some of the holes and. They're going to have a down year because of it, but let's tweak some things so that way when they come back in 2024, they're gunning for that AL West title. Mm-hmm. And I think I think next year you're going to see a little bit of a flip in dynamic, and I think you'll see as long as the Rangers can be healthy next year and they can be consistent like they are this year, Rangers and Mariners, unless the Astros figure out the formula, could be the one and two next year. Maybe not in that order. I don't know. We'll see, but... Next year, I think that's the case. But as far as this year goes, there's one thing that's certain about that division. The death of a franchise? The death of the Oakland Athletics. First off, I love the reverse boycott. That was great. Greatest thing you could have created ever. The way the fact that Oakland then decided, okay, we're going to take this and put this in a spin positively for, the, for us and donate it, which, yes, you know, great for them. They donated it. But at the same time, it's like you, you can't make a positive out of this. No. The boycott was that people would buy tickets to go see your game. That's the whole problem. I'm with them. I need to get a sell, sell the team T-shirt. Yes. I need one of those. My, my my thing is, I mean, I don't think it's just the death of a franchise. I think it's just the death of a sports city. It is because it's the last Cause, team. Because the Raiders have been long, long gone. Yeah. The Warriors are across the bay now. Yep. And now your baseball team's gone. They're the last one. They are the last one. You have nothing left. I still say as soon as o- as the Raiders left, they should have taken out Mount Davis out in center field. Probably. And putting it back to his original to its original facade where there was nothing there. You could the way that ballpark was originally built, because for most people, they don't realize that whole center field structure was not there. 
in the beginning. When that ballpark opened, it was, you know, the bowl, because that was the whole thing, the multi-purpose kind of round bowl system. It was just the field seats. And then past that was the scoreboard and a hill that behind that could see the entire Oakland City skyscraper landscape. You know, the skyline, all of it. I felt they should have gotten rid of Mount Davis. That's a whole other conversation. But I feel like that would have gotten more people back to the ballpark, besides them at least trying to win. But the problem is, as we've seen, and unfortunately because of the movie Moneyball, Oakland has now said, okay, yeah, we can win. Look at what happened. We can win with not spending money. And that's how you saw, that's how you, we've always seen Oakland, at least in our lifetime, act and, and play baseball. And that's how the Rays were for a little bit as well, was they were playing a little money ball. It worked to get them to the World Series over 10 years ago, if you can believe that. 2008. Yeah. With Carlos Pena as the, the lead go-getter for that roster. And a young Evan Longoria. <laughs> yeah. But you see even with the Rays now, they have one of the higher payrolls in all of baseball. Why? Because they're spending money. Yeah, and it's wild because they're a small market team. Exactly, and that's the thing. So it's it's not so that it's not so much so that they are unwilling to spend the money because nobody wants to go to Oakland. It's the owners not wanting to spend the money because the Oakland owners don't want to be in Oakland. So that's the issue right now. They are going after the hotbed mm-hmm. that is Las Vegas, Nevada. Which is, I mean, literally is a hotbed, but I mean, even then, it just, I, it what? surprises me that they would, I'm not so much put their major league team in the same city because Houston and Sugarland, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's like <clears throat> baseball. I feel like already is kind of a struggle in Las Vegas. Like, yes, there's a lot of people that want it, but at the same time, you put them basically within 20 minutes of your triple-A team, what's going to happen to the triple-A team when you've got a 30,000-seat stadium just right there on the strip? My, my thing is that I, I've, I've given this some thought before we switch to the National League real quick because mm-hmm. uh, I know, folks, you're going to come to realize that me and Jordan are very long-winded people. I ramble. I'm not sorry. So do I. <laughs> so, with that said, we you go back to 2016, the year I graduated from high school. Mm-hmm. Las Vegas didn't have a pro team in that city. Nope. They're about to have the big three. Yeah. I say big three loosely because it's the NHL, the NFL, and the MLB. Yeah. They don't have an NBA team there yet. Yeah. And, I don't and the think NBA is in a spot right now where they don't need to expand. No, no one's in relocation issues right I now. I think if they're going to expand, they're going to expand internationally before they go to Vegas. Yes. So I don't think that's so, ever going to be a thing. So I say big three rather loosely. Yeah. But – Hockey has started to work its way around there, and, you know, Golden Knights just won Stanley Cup. Yeah, they did. So, and the Raiders, <laughs> they're trying to figure it out. Look, well, Tom Brady is a, is a minority owner for them, so it's fine. The, Everything is fine. The Golden Boy is going to get them trophies. And I will say. With Garoppolo as the quarterback. And I will say this. <laughs> Allegiant Stadium, very beautiful. Yes. It's a very beautiful look that when we were there in Las Vegas for the WAC tournament, we our hotel was like five minutes away from Allegiant Stadium. Okay. Gorgeous view. Uh, of it. So Vegas is definitely got themselves in a good spot when it comes to pro sports period. Mm-hmm. Oakland, the exact opposite. Right. So we'll see what happens. Oakland's as of this moment is 19 and 55. <laughs> Will they get to 40? I'm wins? sorry for laughing, but I'm not. Will they get to 50 wins? 50? 40? I was going to say 40. And even that's a stretch. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. National League, what the heck? So, okay. My biggest surprise is the Reds, the Central. The East, I'm not as surprised about. Braves nope. leading uh, with Miami, that's a bit of a surprise, too. 42-31 and 31 for second in that division. I'm not surprised about the Phillies. I said this last year, or not last year, but I said in the offseason, Phillies were a one-hit wonder. They were not going to replicate the success they had last year they got and get back to the World Series. At the right time. Exactly. They made a New York Giants run is what they did. But I'm not as surprised. I'm more surprised that the Mets in that division are not doing better with how many almost billions of dollars they spent in the offseason. 
not just with the players, but the brand new three football field big scoreboard they just built in straightaway center. It's the Mets. Yeah. They're going to met it up <laughs> every single time. We need to make a t-shirt of that. We really do. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then the Central doesn't, isn't the biggest, it, 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 it's not the biggest shock because to me. There, there isn't because, that much separation. Because I said at the beginning of the year that that division can go to anybody. Now, granted, I said to anybody but Pittsburgh because <laughs> Pittsburgh's been in the doldrums. Raise of the, the base- Jolly Roger. They've been in the doldrums of the basement for God knows how long. <laughs> And then by late April, they're at the top, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, now this is up for anybody's grabs. What's helping Cincinnati right now is they just swept the Astros, and they are on a hot streak. What's helping them right now is the fact, like you said, they're 9-1 and in their last 10 games. And they just got Votto back. That's what I was going to go with. They just got their franchise guy back. The guy that they paid that 10-year, however many hundreds of million dollars contract, however many years ago, seven, eight years ago, whatever it is, to stay in Cincinnati. Probably the first of the whole, here's a half-year career-long contract deal that really started that trend for whatever reason. But, yeah, the Reds are they're only half a game, though, above the Brewers, so it's not, it's not anything huge. In fact, I think it's the... Smallest lead in any division it is. this year it is. so far. It is the tightest division. The next one is, oddly enough, the AL Central. Cleveland's two games back in Minnesota. There you go. So, I mean, it's impressive. But like you said, at this point, it can go to anybody. I think you have to watch for Pittsburgh as a potential wild card two seed. Uh, maybe a three in that wild card. But even then, it's... It's going to be interesting to see how that shapes out, but I think it might. I don't know. I, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for a, a Pirates win streak right now. And I'm not saying that because I'm a de facto Pirates are my number two team guy, but they're also 2-8 and eight right now. Mm-hmm. At some point, oh, that's going to turn around. Yeah, exactly. They will. And you, one touch on this division. You know who's got the best run differential right now in, in the Central? Please tell me it's the Pirates. It's the Cubs. Ugh. At plus 17. Cincinnati is minus 18, Milwaukee's uh, minus 24, Pittsburgh's minus 32, and uh, St. Louis at the bottom has the best run differential of all the ones in the negative right now at thir- negative 13. <laughs> so St. Louis is not out of, the, is not out of it by any No, but they're either. also 13 games under. That, that's the problem. I think the problem is, as well, is that I think they're kind of in a state of what do we do now? Because you lost Yachty. He went into retirement. And Wayno decided to come back. And Wayno's coming back, but only this year because he's retiring after this year. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of in a, what do we do now? We have probably the best third baseman in the game in Paul Goldschmidt. We have a couple of guys, but there's no identity. Last year, what carried them didn't really do much. They made a little bit of postseason noise, but not much. What carried them was Albert Pujols. Coming back and and doing what he did was what carried them. But I'm just yeah, I'm just I, looking at this roster and I don't recognize many names. That's the thing. It's like there's there's not a lot of guys that that kind of stand out when you when you look at the, the roster. The only guys that are still here from the glory days of St. Louis yeah. is Wayno. Mm-hmm. Weird to say, Paul DeYoung, <laughs> and that's about it. Yeah, but even then, I mean, and, and maybe Tyler O'Neill. But I mean, um, you even go back four years from 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 now, it's like it seems like there's been a little bit of turnover. But at the same time, it's just there's nobody that stands out and there's nobody that's really taking charge besides Goldschmidt. And bueno. Well, you got Arenado. I mean, you got Arenado, but even then, like, I don't It just it doesn't it, it, there's not enough there. And that's the problem. They're I, I, they're not in a re- retooling. I think they're in the starts. As much as Cardinals fans may hate to say it, I think they're in the start of the let's rebuild and figure it out. I think they're. I think you see Goldschmidt and Arenado as kind of the lead, the guys that stay, but eventually get traded, like the Carlos Lee, Michael Bourne, Hunter Pence of the Astros when they started to rebuild. I think they're going to be the guys that once they go, everybody's like, okay, we're in a rebuild. We've got five years to figure it out. Mm-hmm. But I think that's what's going on with the Cardinals right now. Looking at the West, 
Diamondbacks don't really surprise me. They've, as of the last couple of years, have been doing really well. Um, the Dodgers surprised me with the 39-33 and 33 record. Granted, you That's... lost some key players in the last few years in the offseason, so you figured at some point it was going to have to happen because it's happening with the Yankees, it's happening with the Astros, and those have been the three teams that have been the de facto tops of baseball for the last well, four, that, five, six years. That's that that's that brings back another meme I saw yesterday. Yeah. The Astros, the Dodgers, and the Yankees going into yesterday mm-hmm. all had the same record and they're all third in their division. So it's that Spider Man meme <laughs> of them pointing at each other. Oh man. Isn't that crazy? Three of the most dominant franchises since twenty seventeen are starting to see the end of their golden eras. If you will. Now look at now you look at all three of those. Mm-hmm. Just a fun little point I just thought about just now. The Astros have two World Series titles in that span. Mm-hmm. The Dodgers have one with a fat asterisk next to it. I'm <laughs> sure there's one next to the, our 2017 one, <laughs> but there's a fat asterisk next to the one in 2020 as well. The Mickey Mouse title. Yes. <laughs> I just love seeing that the Yankees don't have a single title in that span. Well, yeah, because we kept eliminating them every year. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, the West doesn't all the way shock me outside of maybe the Dodgers. You know, the Padres are still hanging around. The Padres disappoint me. They do. They, they disappoint me because they have probably, in my honest opinion, they have the best roster in Major League Baseball. Look at the lineup. I'm going to look at this because every time I look at it, it is a sight to behold. Also, quick shout-out, they have probably the best broadcast team in all of baseball. Oh, a thousand percent. Orsillo and Mud, oh my mm-hmm. gosh, they are fantastic. Yeah, the, yeah this, this. Here's here's your lineup from from the nineteenth: Tatis, Soto, Machado, Bogarts, Cronenworth, Sanchez, Odor, Kim, Grisham. That's your nine. That's insane. There are teams in Major League Baseball right now that would kill to have at least two of those guys. <laughs> That's insane. And, I just, and, I, I and don't the, understand. I think I have the the reason why. Probably that bullpen. Probably. It probably is. I'm looking at this bullpen right now. Luis Garcia is the only name I recognize. (laughs) And not because we have a Luis Garcia. I know of this Luis Garcia. Yeah. Okay, Josh Hader, too. Yeah. But then, and then, of course, you got the starters as well. You got Musgrove. Musgrove, Snell, and Michael Waka. And here's the thing, too. You look at their numbers so far, in regards to pitching – they're the seventh best team in all of baseball, second best in the National League, I, I think behind that, the Braves. I think maybe another big part of it too is, and, and this is just me. And probably, that's in regards to ERA. This that is, is probably me just being a little slightly ignorant uh, of the because I don't I don't follow the Padres as close as I do as the Astros. Maybe mm-hmm. there was a lot of close games. I think that's the case because you look at the Astros; they're number one in baseball in team ERA, and we're thirty nine and thirty four. Mm-hmm. So I think that might be the case. Is a lot of close games. They allow the Padres allow a batting average of just two thirty two, and their run that's insane. Their run differential is plus twenty one. That's the thing. So I think there's a lot of those close games that that end up making it to where they don't get some of those games. They have what is it? Uh, twelve games that they did that they blew a save. So I think that's part of the problem. They're twenty of thirty two in save opportunities, and a lot of those probably resulted in losses. So well, yeah. So, well, you can blow a save. Yeah, you can blow a save and still win. win. Yeah, but yeah, the general I would think is when you blow that save, you probably end up losing the game, like you said. So but that, that, if that point were, being, yeah, if they're all losses, that's twelve losses on the board right there. They're probably my biggest, and I would think a good amount of people in baseball, at least the ones that follow it, you know, a lot. I would say would probably be my biggest disappointment so far this season. Now, who knows? They could turn things around. They could go get a bullpen guy at the deadline, and they could make a run for that title in the West. But it's going to take a hope prior in a dance since they're eight and a half games back. Well, folks, this segment went on way longer than it should have. <laughs> but one thing is for certain, there's still about 88, 89 games left to be played, and there's a lot that can still happen. Who knows? The Colorado Rockies could come out of nowhere <laughs> and do the unthinkable. Okay. It probably won't happen. <laughs> We're going to step aside and take a break. Coming up, our final segment, we will be doing a debriefing of the 2022-2023 seasons for both the Huntsville Hornet Athletic Program and the Sam Houston Bearcat Athletic Program. That's coming up next here on the KSAM Sports Podcast.